welcome everybody to uh, the uh, first um, webinar on international lending uh, by CPR. Uh, I'm very happy um, to launch this series, um, which is uh, one of the main events of the new research and policy network of CPR focusing on international lending and sovereign debt. So the, um, the RPN, the, the, the network aims to bring together people working on um, the topics of international lending, uh, international capital flows and sovereign debt. So newest challenges in these fields of the, which there are many, um, public debt levels are at record levels. Um, debt sustainability is back on the, on the global policy agenda. And we've seen a wave of debt crisis and defaults in the uh, global South. Um, uh, so many questions, many open questions um, um, are out there, M much exciting new work. Uh, of which some uh, we hope to see here. Um, the, the RPN has a special focus on um, the rise of new creditor powers and new developments in the international financial architecture, new technologies. Uh, so the rise of China or China's role in the fin international financial system will be one of these foci, um, but also uh, technological advances, exactly the, the, the theme of this topic. Um, we have a a series of, of great speakers coming up. Uh, uh, the, the webinar is always on the first Thursday of the month, always at this time. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, the, the frequency will be every month or every second month. So we'll expect about eight uh, such talks per year. So it will be a regular event. Uh, and the next uh, presentations will be by Helen Ray on June 1 and by Ricardo Rice on July 6th. Uh, for today, I am uh, very, very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Ken Rogoff and uh, Clemens Graf von Luckner uh, to present their uh, exciting, uh, fascinating and innovative uh, work on the link between cryptocurrency and international capital flows. I'm not aware that any such paper uh, or any, any related paper exists. I'm very excited that uh, they are kicking off this, this seminar with such an important uh, topic. Uh, I guess uh, uh, Ken uh, does not need much introduction. He's one of the eminent uh, macroeconomists worldwide um, and uh, extremely glad uh, that he accepted the invitation to, um, to be the inaugural speaker of this series. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, I'll keep the introduction short so you have more time. Uh, let me just also uh, briefly introduce uh, Clemens, uh, who is a uh, PhD student at Sciences Po. I have known him for a while. He's become a veritable expert in sovereign debt. He's working on a range of very exciting projects. I expect more, much more to come from him. He's not yet on the job market, but uh, at some point he will be, so look out for him. All right, thank you so much. We'll have 60 minutes for the presentation and then 50 minutes for Q&A, and uh, that hopefully will work in a way that you can actually raise uh, your voice and, and ask questions uh, in person. All right, with no further ado, uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, the floor is yours, Ken and Clements. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christoph, for uh, inviting us. And thank you to everyone who's here. Um, I, I, I should mention, and it says it on the slide that, that was just put up, that there's a third co-author, uh, Carmen Reinhardt, who uh, for various reasons might not be able to join us or may end up coming in later, uh, we'll see. Um, and uh, we've, been, uh, we've been working on this paper for uh, quite some time. Uh, we started it uh, when both Clemens and Carmen had shortly after they arrived at the World Bank. So, um, there's a tremendous amount of excitement about cryptocurrencies and debate about cryptocurrencies, but there's uh, remarkably little hard evidence on their transactions use. And that's what we aim to address in this paper. The theoretical literature certainly gets it right. Uh, there's a range of theoretical uh, papers we cite uh, 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 they're listed uh, uh, here, you know, including Susan Athey and Harold Ulig and others, uh, Fernando's uh, Villaverde and Sanchez, um, which the, just work basically assume that 
I'm going to call it Bitcoin for simplicity here, but could be other cryptocurrencies, can be used for transactions. And the models are actually rather a lot like standard money mon monetary models. And it's just taken as given that they can be used for transactions. But when it comes to looking uh, at the evidence, there's people who are very skeptical. There are a lot of people who say, well, it's not, they're just basically not used at all. It's purely uh, gambling. There's nothing uh, really going on. And the fundamental value of these uh, cryptocurrencies is just basically zero. And so uh, it's a pure speculative bubble. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of journalistic articles saying it's used, and I would go maybe opaque research pieces claiming that crypto are used a lot. You'll see uh, estimates as high as 25 and even 50% of international capital flows uh, being done through crypto. I don't really know how they get those numbers. And of course, it's hard because uh, the data are either not shared by exchanges, and so you can't tell that way, or to the extent they're done directly on chain, I'll explain that distinction in a second, uh, by, by design, they're very, uh, they're very opaque uh, and you, uh, difficult to erase. Yeah, yes, yes, you can see all the transactions but you, the whole point is it's not so easy to see uh, who did the transactions. And I perfectly well, and we perfectly well understand that yes, with enough resources, these things can be traced, but uh, it, it's, we're not, if you're talking about sort of plain vanilla tax evasion or moving uh, half a million dollars around, uh, it's, it's probably not worth it in most cases for governments to try to figure this out. Of course, if there's a terrorism uh, incident or something, uh, uh, then they can. I, I uh, maybe come back to it um, uh, later. A, a big question is what is regulation going to be? Because uh, there, there are people who say, well, you can't regulate uh, crypto. And yet, uh, I think, you know, one study we cite in the paper that uh, I would mention by Auer and Steinklausen's, uh, it was a, a, a few years ago in the BIS, where they look at news reports on things like bans on financial transactions with crypto. Uh, crypto. Uh, it's not just news reports, announcements of these things. Uh, they look at announcements on how it'll be treated under security laws uh, or events signaling it's not going to be treated as a currency uh, and anti-money laundering. And they find these things have a big effect on the price, given the claim that the government can't do anything. I should mention, you know, parenthetically, they find that if um, some central bank governor uh, or a regulator opines that they think they should do something, but don't aren't specific, that has almost uh, no effect. So the, the regulatory game is very much in process. It lies ahead. It's very fast moving and, uh, and changing. So our focus uh, in this paper is not the one, if you haven't read the paper before, um, I assume most of you haven't. It's not the one of, which is 99% of the literature looks at what we call on-chain transactions. Those are the ones you read about chain analysis where um, uh, people are moving uh, uh, from one Bitcoin wallet to another. And actually, those are only a very small part of the transactions use of cryptocurrencies. The vast majority, and we give some estimates in the paper, but let's call it 95% of transactions are done through exchanges where you hold cryptocurrency on the exchange kind of like you would in a bank account. And you can trade, you can put add money to your bank account from outside the exchange. You can uh, export it uh, outside the exchange. But a lot of the action takes inside the exchange, takes place inside the exchange, 
where people are trading with one another. And actually, that doesn't show up on the blockchain analysis at all. Uh, because, say, Coinbase, it's a giant uh, uh, firm. Uh, it's just in Bitcoin, it just has one wallet. So it's only when things uh, on the Bitcoin chain. So it's only when things go in and out that we see uh, the transactions, but not all these, uh, these other transactions. So unfortunately, a lot of that data, which could be requested by regulators, but by and large, this space remains very lightly regulated. Uh, you can't get a, get a hold of, but we uh, found two exchanges that publish their data. Uh, and one is a Finnish uh, uh, regulated in Finland uh, and another, you know, uh, claims not to have a central regulator. Uh, uh, one of them is called Local Bitcoins, the other called Paxful. I know some of you know a lot and you know have, have looked at these and are aware of them, but they actually publish every transaction and you can download it maybe with a fair bit of effort, but you can download the exact time the transaction took place. And because they're on a, uh, uh, because um, these are, um, uh, left out a critical step. Um, these are really um, uh, matching uh, buyers and sellers within the exchange. Uh, they, uh, they're recorded instantaneously and someone will, uh, you, it, you can have transactions where someone buys with one currency, but then sells and receives another currency. Uh, 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 within within the exchange, and you actually record what these currencies were and uh, when they happened. And in the case of one of the exchanges, Paxful, it actually gives you the geolocation of where the entity doing uh, doing the trade is. So um, the data is also interesting because it's reported. The amount traded is reported to uh, in in uh, uh, Satoshi, which is out to eight decimal places, out out to the hundred millionth. And uh, so you'll see these numbers that are very infrequent. In fact, you know a lot, uh, there are certain numbers like you know point one Bitcoin, which you might see quite frequently, but a lot of numbers which are sort of seem like random drawings and you don't uh, don't see. And uh, we got this idea uh, that maybe we would be able to trace uh, transactions use of uh, Bitcoin, transactions use of these uh, cryptocurrencies, the, the one we look at in these two exchanges is, uh, is Bitcoin, by finding uh, two trades very close to each other in time that have exactly the same uh, out to the hundred million uh, fraction of a Bitcoin, which is rare in the data. In fact, a lot of them only occur once or twice. And so we try to find a window within which we're going to look at the transactions and see uh, whether or not uh, whether or not they match. Uh, there, there's some we we can't really explore because they occur so frequently, like at, at point one. But there are many which are quite uh, quite rare. And the uh, we we uh, we have a period of uh, uh, several years uh, of having uh, daily data. It covers 163 countries. These two exchanges are by far the most global of any exchanges uh, that exist. And uh, we develop an algorithm for trying to detect transactions use. So, um, so it, uh, we need to pick a window that we're going to look in, and you'll see there are various considerations of the shorter the window we have, the less likelihood of a false positive. There just happens to be another trade at that size. And as we make the window larger, that goes up. Although 
the algorithm with, that we use actually adjusts for that so that uh, we still uh, get, I think, an accurate confidence interval. And uh, we find uh, it, it, our, our lower bound on the number of transactional trades is 11%, but we give another uh, number of arguments that uh, could be actually quite a bit larger, including when we look at a, um, uh, an, an experiment where Venezuela's power went down. Now, in this first slide, uh, you'll see at the bottom, it mentions that uh, cryptocurrency activity is very high in certain countries. Uh, it's not, we don't imagine that it's being used routinely for transactions in or uh, payments just involving the United States to Europe necessarily. But if we're looking at uh, countries like Nigeria, Lebanon, Argentina, Cuba, Iran, Venezuela, uh, cryptocurrency is very popular there. There's an IMF paper uh, which uh, talks about uh, 1920, uh, 2022 paper, which talks about how corruption and capital controls seem to be a big explanatory variable in the use of on-chain transactions, we certainly find uh, uh, something uh, very similar here. And so uh, we, we try to have an algorithm for giving um, the our estimate of the number of transactions. It seems pretty accurate. I, I, just to clarify, this, this is maybe not, maybe not the most precise way to describe it, but I think of it as like the birthday problem. You're out to a hun uh, hundredth of a million uh, in decimal places, but Nevertheless, when you have a few thousand observations, it's more likely than you think that there would be two identical ones within, say, a five-hour window, which is the central window that we look at, just like when you have 30 people in the same room, or it might even only be 22, you need, you know, you quickly get to a 50-50 chance that two people have the same birthday. So we basically have to control for that uh, in our uh, in our algorithm. Now, let me just say a few further things by way of this introduction. These are two small markets. So they're, you know, the total number of transactions is actually huge in the, uh, you know, hundreds of million. And uh, just in these markets, just in these exchanges, not so far from the same order of magnitude as all the on-chain transactions. But remember, I said at the beginning that the off-chain is actually much bigger than the on-chain. Uh, so if it became possible, one could you know, extend this. Uh, nevertheless, I, I do think it gives a very interesting window. We, we think we find pretty strong and decisive confirmation of transactions use. And I would make an analogy to another topic I worked on some time ago, trying to identify the use of large denomination notes in transactions. It's very hard. There's very little data on it. It's from Sting uh, surveys, things like that. And I'd, I'd actually you know, say over the years, it's quite valuable to have these windows into what is happening, but um, you know, it, it uh, and I, and I think we got something similar here. And, and you know, you may come from, uh, you may have done a lot of crypto transactions and say, well, of course they're used. But you would be surprised at how many scholars, uh, you know, sort of say, no, that's not true. It's a pure uh, speculative bubble. And so uh, we, we think that we're providing something interesting here. Let me just uh, lastly, you know, say a little bit about the international dimensions and the uh, and regulation. The international dimensions in our data sets seem quite significant. Uh, they cert that's certainly consistent with things people find in this indirect evidence on the on-chain transactions. I I should mention you can't do what we're doing for on-chain transactions because you're not able to time stamp the transactions because the on-chain transactions are very expensive and they're uh, put into blocks and the blocks can sit for a while before they trade. You, you can't line up the transactions in the same way that we do here. 
uh, and it, it's certainly, I think, clear that these are used a lot. And, uh, and but it's a it's a moving target because regulations are changing. Of course, since the fall of FTX uh, at the end of last year, the crypto um, exchange suddenly the SEC and the FTC and the European Commission have been energized to do more. And you see that in some developing economies. But on the other hand, I would say that if you look at a lot of uh, emerging markets and particularly countries which are under sanctions by the United States, there's a lot of interest in keeping uh, cri cryptocurrencies alive and well. Uh, I even had a, a really good thesis student this year, uh, Matthew Perante, who did a paper about the use and potential use of cryptocurrencies and central bank reserves, and perhaps some of the issues that we look at in identifying their transactions will come up there. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Clemens. Um, thank you so much. <clears throat> so um, after after this introduction, I um, have the, the the privilege of of going a little bit into the weeds. I think um, the big picture is is hopefully. Um, let me see if I can just. Ah, here we go. Um, pretty clear, but but I but I think many many might be wondering. Okay, so how does this actually work, and how do we um, actually move capital through a crypto vehicle as a as a as an instrument? And then how do we identify when people actually precisely use this in a bit more uh, rigorous way than, than um, how, how Kenneth just um, lined, outlined it? So I will first quickly go over this conceptually and then afterwards go into in how our algorithm works. And um, the concept I think is, is somewhat clear from what Ken already said, but I think running by one example is, is quite useful. Um, when I've presented this in Argentina, I skipped those slides because everyone knows it because a lot of people are using it. When I presented it in, in, in France, uh, there, you know, people needed to get a little bit more about it. So I'll go into a little bit more detail here. Um, so how this technically works, if, if we say, okay, well, there's a person A here who wants to send some money abroad and they're in a country where, you know, sending it with a bank account might be tricky or they just have a preference not to for other reasons. And so rather than going to the bank and making an international bank transfer, they'll go to any exchange and they'll buy their Bitcoin against local currency. The next thing they do is then um, on the same exchange or on a different exchange, depending on, on um, what their particular situation is, sell that Bitcoin against another currency overseas. And by set, because Bitcoin, I mean, obviously as a digital asset, doesn't really have a location. It's super simple to you know, buy the, the Bitcoin in Buenos Aires and afterwards sell it in New York. And, um, and in exchange for that second sale, basically receive local currency, in this case, maybe US dollars, um, in an offshore or in bank account overseas, an investment or to pay for a good. Um, essentially, in, in this like very quick transaction, you moved your local currency from Buenos Aires to wherever the United States or where you wanted it to be, um, be it for you know illicit or illicit uh, purpose. So um, that conceptually is pretty clear. Now, the issue is that um, such a use case is quite hard to identify in the, in the data because, as Ken mentioned, um, well, it's called cryptocurrency for a reason. The data is not exactly extremely transparent, and so um, the data that we are that we are that we found that actually allows us to do something there um, is from two these two local uh, the, these two international peer to peer exchange platforms that Ken already mentioned. Just to give you a bit of an idea of, of what this data set looks like, we have a total of one hundred and twenty eight million um, trades since two thousand seventeen. With a trade volume of 19 billion, which underlines well, this is not nothing, but at the same time, it's it's tiny compared to 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 um, to you know other um, let's say assets of international capital flow. So this is really to underline this idea that this is a window into this world. This crypto the crypto world is much bigger than these these two exchanges, of course. Um, the average trade size on this um, on on these two exchanges is 150 US dollars, which kind of well, it uh, falls within within a range that is maybe you know within the line of, of what people see a lot in maybe remittances transfers, but also makes sense if you want to send bigger some numbers because well if you don't want to be um, detected then maybe smaller transactions make more sense. Um, then the, we also have some pretty large transactions on there, so the biggest one is just over two million US dollars, and as Ken already mentioned, um, in total there's one hundred and sixty three fiat currencies that um, one can use to purchase or sell. Bitcoin on these two exchanges. 
Um, I'm not going to go much to the deta in details on how this differs from the blockchain data because Ken has already covered that, but we'll instead kind of um, try to, to give an, just reiterate on this intuition of, of our approach. So essentially in the beginning, we looked at this huge data set and we had it in front of us and said, okay, how can we actually see anything happening here? We just see, okay, there's like at some points, trade volumes go up, sometimes they go down, but what can we actually do to actually detect it with whether or not people are using this to send money and from one country to the other. And this is where we realized that, um, well, it's quite cool that in this data, rather than when you have commodity trades where you know things are denominated in US dollars and in cents, Bitcoin has Satoshi as the equivalent to the cent, but not there's not a hundred cents making up a dollar, but there's a hundred million Satoshi making up one Bitcoin. And that means any nominal that we see in our data is quite rare to be precise. 66% um, of the trade sizes occur only once or twice within the whole sample. So seeing the same trade size happening twice at all over the whole five, six years that we cover is a bit like matching snowflakes. Seeing the same trade size happening twice within a really short period of time is something that is, you know, at least curious. And that's what we kind of try to, to trace. And so what we are trying to, to say is, well, if we see the same trade size that is so precise happening in a really short period of time, then that could actually be one of those instances where someone is buying Bitcoin and then selling it somewhere else um, to move their, their, their money abroad or to a different location. Um, and so, so the only key assumption that that kind of needs to rely on is that people would not like to do this you know, buy Bitcoin this week and then finish the transaction in two weeks from now. That assumption, like if people did that, then, you know, these trades would fall very far, far apart. But because Bitcoin trades have been extremely volatile, um, this is, I mean, it's been all over the, the, the media and, and, um, and it's been kind of affected, it's hard to, to, to ignore. Um, people have, generally have an incentive to, you know, finish these transactions fairly quickly. So to minimize their exposure to the volatile volatility in Bitcoin prices. And so the whole idea of our algorithm is really just to look at some short enough time windows and match these snowflakes, these trade sizes to see if um, we can see patterns there. So um, the identification algorithm that I will go over and I'll try to go over in some detail without going into all in, into the weeds too much, all of this can, I have it in the in the appendix here, but can also be obviously um, studied further in the paper. It's split in two parts. In the first part, I'll I, I'll discuss how we identify when it's when we want to basically see if one single trade is or can be classified as a crypto vehicle trade, as we as we call them. So that is when people use it to to send money um, into another local current, uh, fiat currency. And then afterwards, I'll quickly discuss on how we then use all of these individually identified trades to arrive at a a share of the total trade volume that we identify as crypto vehicle trades, which is important because, you know, moving from the, the individual hypothesis, uh, like a hypothesis test to the multiple hypothesis test just needs a couple of tweaks that um, need to be taken into account there. So um, the identify the identification algorithm, there's for in, in this like very simplified version, all you need to kind of keep in a mind is that for every um, trade, we call them I, there is a trade size XI. And these are, you know, these, these very unique large size trades, uh, like with, with eight uh, decimal places that we, that we have. Finally, uh, very importantly, also we define as a small NI, the number of times that any given trade size XI occurs within five hours prior to a trade. Now, the five hours, that's just a number we, we, we used. We will show later that it doesn't really matter if we use 10 or 2 or 24. It, the, the algorithm works regardless. Um, and then generally what we're interested in when we're trying to identify individual trades and see whether or not they are a candidate to be a crypto vehicle trade is, of course, when NI is greater than zero. That is to say, in the five hours prior to a trade, there has already been a trade that looks just like they has the exact same trade size as, as our trade that we're looking at at a given point in time. Now, we need to take into account, however, that not every trade size is a snowflake. And this is what Ken already mentioned in the beginning. For example, the trade size of one Bitcoin is something that we see quite a lot in the data. And so maybe I can quickly show you the illustration of the trade size distribution, if it works. Doesn't seem to work, unfortunate. Okay, uh, here we go. Nope. Mm. Here we go. Um, what you see here is these spikes at uh, certain trade sizes. And that is um, 
basically what what I what Ken just mentioned earlier with point one Bitcoin, and also we see that there's the nominal size of one Bitcoin, two Bitcoin, two point five, and four, and so on. This is basically nominal trade sizes that we see quite a lot in the data, which makes some sense. And I, I guess when people want to buy Bitcoin because they want to speculate Bitcoin, maybe they want to say, okay, I own one Bitcoin. Um, and so they that's what they kind of add as a nominal. Um, it, it's a different sort of story when what they're actually trying to do is send a certain amount of fiat currency into, into another fiat currency, then they're more likely to be wanting to say, okay, I'm sending $500. And I well, I get the number of Bitcoin, whatever the five hundred dollars times the Bitcoin price at that point in time is. Um, so, so we we need to kind of take into account that different Bitcoin like nominals, these trade sizes, have a different probability to happen over time, and that's what the algorithm um, seeks to do. So, to arrive at sort of a probability that we can then attach to a certain trade. Um, being or not being a, a crypto vehicle trade, we need to um, set up a null model. That is to say, the the assumption of what our trades or of what would make up our sample if there was no crypto vehicle trades at all. And so the assumption that we apply here is that we say, okay, if there was if there was really just people randomly buying crypto and selling crypto, then then we could model this probably as as um, an, a set of independent Poisson processes where every trade size. And follows one of one um, independent Poisson process. Um, under once we follow that assumption, we can then condition on the number of trades that occur within a five-hour period, and that allows us to uh, derive the probability of any trade i that we look at finding a match within five hours, which actually follows a multinomial draw. So this is um, the birthday problem formula that you kind of see in front of you here, and this is is pretty uh, familiar um, because this is what it simplifies to when um, under our null or other under this null model assumption and so the what you see are basically well we take into account the probability of any trade having like there's an inherent sort of probability um, of certain trade sizes arriving as i just said one bitcoin is quite probable so 0 0.032413312 will be much less probable we arrive at this um, p hat by just looking at the distribution of the trades prior to that trade arriving and then we just um, also take into account the number of trades that occur within a given point a period of time, because that obviously increases the probability of a, of a random trade as well. And then um, to find the arrive at a discovery, that is basically us saying, okay, we find a trade that we think is very likely to be um, a um, crypto vehicle trade. We just need to consider all the trades where we do find a match. So an I being greater than zero and where we can reject this null hypothesis, that is to say, um, we set some threshold. In our case, we say 5%. So we arrive at and those crypto vehicle trades with a 95% confidence level. And um, and when this this capital of theta is or when when theta is um, smaller than capital of theta, and we can reject our null hypothesis and we can declare a discovery on that given trade. Um, so if I just maybe show you an example of how this works in practice, I think this is maybe illustrative. So. Um, in this particular example, there was a trade um, on uh, November 1st, 2020 in US dollars. There was a trade size that you can see it here. And then there was a trade size very soon after in um, Venezuelan Bolivar. And, um, and over the period of five hours that happened prior to the second trade, there was a total of 4,086 trades that occurred altogether. Because this trade size happens to be a more common one in the data, um, when we actually apply our, our algorithm here, we find a probability of this match being random, which is around 27%. Around, uh, and so in this case, we would not be able to reject our null hypothesis and this trade would have a match, but we wouldn't discover, consider it a crypto vehicle trade because in this particular case, um, there's just a probability of it happen ran, ha having happened randomly. That's a bit too, too, too high. Um, I hope that is, this is roughly clear. And then how do we arrive at the share in, in total? Well, um, I'm going to try to go over this also in like very broad strokes. There's a more, more, more de lot more detail in the paper, but essentially what we do is we um, consider like taking into account this multiple hypothesis testing framework, because obviously you can, we cannot just sum up all of the individual discoveries because, well, they all are considered at an or individual hypothesis test, but we need to take into account that well, if you do a hundred hypothesis tests with a 95% confidence level, then at worst, you, you have a bias of 5% in your data. And so um, the, the way that um, we show in the data is 
um, is valid to, to deal with this is, is to say, well, we need to actually look at what would be the number of trades that we would identify as crypto vehicle trades, so trades that um, have a, a p-value or the, of less than um, 5%, um, even under the null model. And so the what we show in the paper is that we can, we show this as, as a very simple proof, that if you take the total sum of all theta heads, you actually get sort of a, um, a controlling factor that allows us to arrive at an unbiased estimate of the total share of trades that um, are crypto vehicle trades in the data. Now, this is very abstract. Let's actually look at what this what this um, ends up in looking at when we look at the, the numbers. So, as I said earlier, we have um, just over 128 million trades in the in the data. Um, of those, nearly 18 million have a match in the five hours prior to to um, the, the trade arriving. Now, many of those matches are simply because they're very common trade sizes. So once we net out all the ones where the probability of that rate being matched randomly being greater than um, 5%, we arrive at 16.5 million. And then we net the expected false discovery rate that I just quickly um, touched upon. We arrive at 14.2 million, and that's around 11.1% of crypto vehicle trades. Now, that's an unbiased, probabilistic, probabilistically unbiased um, estimate. There's obviously no reason for all trades to for people doing this necessarily always having exactly the same nominal, right? It could be that, well, we list a whole number of reasons in this paper of why that could not be the case, but it could be that people, you know, buy the first trade with one person, but then split it in, in multiple ones because they send it to different members of their family um, on, on, on the second leg of the trade, and then we would miss those. So this is really an, 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 a lower bound. It's unbiased probabilistically, but it's a lower bound in, in the concrete um, fact, and, and we'll... Um, you can uh, have a look Cle at. Yeah. Clement, do you want to just mention about the difference between this and the genetics literature? Um, because we have uh, observed the Absolutely. whole sample. So this is a it's very yeah, it's a very important um, point. So when this this false discovery, like this false discovery um, rate discussion is actually something that is much more important in the genetics literature, where um, at no point in time you can actually have the data of the whole genetic distribution. And so um, the the false discovery rate netting is actually a very complex um, or much more complex sort of discussion. The nice benefit that we have of having the total of our two data sets is that we can calculate this um, the sum of the theta hats, um, which is basically what in the genetics literature um, typically um, is thought to uh, is basically something that one has to estimate because one doesn't actually have the total distribution of the total data on the on the whole set of um, of of the theta heads essentially. In our case, this makes this this calculation much easier. Mm, so this is eleven point one percent. Might be interesting, but then okay, what does that really tell us? I think it gets much more interesting when we actually have a look at okay, once we've identified these trades. What are these sort of what are the transactions that we're seeing in data? Who's sending money to whom? Um, what are the 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 parties involved? And um, and so this is I think a, a nice way to 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 present it. What you see here is the red dots. That's the sending party. The um, the triangles. The green one is the destinations, and the the thickness of the lines gives you an information of how important. Um, that channel is compared to like to, compared to the other channels among these top 25 uh, most important crypto vehicle channels. And what we see here is um, well, sort of like I think quite supportive of what of that what we're picking up here is not random at all because the countries that appear very prominent are all countries where, as I mentioned before, there's some incentive to actually be using this sort of channel because other channels are not open, like moving money out of Argentina. Um, or to um, Venezuela is, is, is very complex um, because of capital controls, because of dysfunctional banking systems. Um, similar, we see, similarly, we see other countries where there's capital controls and very um, you know, thriving parallel exchange rates in, as a consequence um, appear very prominently in, in this data. And I think so. Yeah, this is quite interesting. Um, this is sort of presenting the same thing, um, looking a little bit also at the fact that um, what these sort of currency to currencies transactions look like across different currencies. So we see, for example, um, Ghana, the Ghana in city being traded a lot against US dollar, but also Nigerian Naira. People do send money 
um, to to um, to other currencies, but there's very little transactions with the Russian ruble, for example, whereas in other currencies, like in Belarus, we do see a lot of transactions that go um, to the Russian ruble first and then to Belarus or vice versa. Now, um, to provide you with a little bit more evidence, we basically have two things that I would like to, to present here. First of all, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to say that these five hours that we pick are a bit random because one could also say, well, people might want to do it much quicker or one might say, oh, well, actually, because people need to make those transactions and it takes time, maybe one should rather consider a 24 hour time window. Um, it turns out that it kind of really doesn't matter what time window you use. So we have this trade-off that generally happens. The false discovery rate increases quite a bit um, the p-values also get inflated as the number of trades that happen, for example, over a 10-hour window on average, twice as many as, as over a five-hour window. So that leads to less trades being classified with a 95% confidence level as, um, as crypto vehicle transactions. But as you see in this graph, it doesn't really matter whether we apply a two, a five, or a 10-hour window, because these different factors, basically, the algorithm leads to a situation where they where they balance out. And so um, it, that is a bit of an arbitrary decision that we apply a five hour window to the results that we pre present, but it doesn't really have a huge impact on, on the results. Um, then the other thing that uh, I, I think is, is quite interesting and that kind of goes away from this um, algorithm altogether is that we said, okay, um, this is interesting, but it's all kind of evidence from within this realm of our algorithm working and it kind of suggests like it requires that what we're what we're imagining here actually being right so is there something that we can do that is completely remote for it and so there is actually and I think it's quite interesting because it is it's it, it draws a really interesting um additional sort of story and that supports that what is happening here are, is unlikely to just be speculate or speculators buying and selling bitcoin because they're huddling or whatever people call these things um so what you see here is a graph that um, is from the crypto trades around um, the March 9th, 2019 in Venezuela. What happened March 9th, 2019 in Venezuela? There is a, the, a dam that's called the Guri Dam. It's a power, um, it's an electric, um, hydroelectric power plant in Venezuela that provides the vast majority of the electric power of the country, um, or at that time provided the vast majority of it. And because of a um, accident, uh, it was a fire close to the dam. Um, there, what happened is that around 72% of the, the um, population didn't have access to, to electricity anymore for two and a half, three days. And so what one would expect, of course, when electricity runs out is that people cannot purchase crypto anymore because you do need at least your phone, if not your computer. And as the battery of your phone runs out, you cannot make these transactions anymore. So what one would indeed expect is the blue line. That is to say that the trade volume of um, Bitcoin in Venezuela dropping significantly around this power cut. Now, what we do also see, though, is that the countries that we just earlier in the map, remember um, this, Countries that um, seem to be trading with Venezuela, sending money to or receiving money from Venezuela a lot. So these are mostly neighboring countries. See, similar to the exact sort of magnitude drop um, in their trade volumes around that period of time, which is very interesting because it kind of is only explainable, at least from our point of view, if you consider that, well, if people are trading with one another and all of a sudden one party kind of drops out because they don't have electricity anymore, it would make sense for um, there to be a similar drop in, let's say, Mexico and Peru or in Chile. If instead all of these were just independently speculating, then this sort of image wouldn't make any sense. And now you might wonder, okay, interesting, so maybe there was something happening globally and maybe that's just a day when nobody was trading crypto because the price spiked. Well, if instead we look at countries that we don't find to have any vehicle trades to uh, Venezuela and that are also regionally quite um, remote. So here we look, for example, at uh, China, Singapore or Russia. We don't see any effect of the Venezuelan power cut on um, the trade volumes in those countries at that given point in time, which we interpret as, as quite strong additional evidence that um, they are, they must be like, for the story of crypto vehicle trades taking, taking place. Um, now, one might also wonder, well, then what is actually going on there and why are people doing this? And we kind of alert to this idea that, well, there must be an incentive to use these sort of channels rather than um, 
than interbank like an interbank wire transfer. And so um, what we what we then then did here, just like because there's a bit of anecdotal evidence essentially, is to look at what happened in Argentina around 2020 when the country had once again a parallel market being born because. Um, as the Macri government uh, left um, office, they reimposed the capital controls in the country. And what we see is that just parallel with the parallel market rising up, we also see a significant increase in the number of crypto trades securing, which is in our eyes, just another um, piece of evidence that, you know, once the incentives are there to use this trans this, to actually, this sort of um, purchase of crypto to avoid capital controls, for example, we actually see this increase. Now, finally, we've like kind of talked about the very big picture, and uh, and I and and so I, I sometimes I just wanted to uh, well, essentially at some point we wanted to understand how does this stuff actually work on the ground, and so uh, maybe this is interesting for some, and I'll go over it uh, fairly quickly. But at some point we just wanted to have a look at okay, what what does this what does this look like when people actually use buy Bitcoin to send money abroad in uh, concretely, and so what you see here. Just a little bit of anecdotal evidence to make this a little bit more easy to understand. What you see here is um, a picture from a shop um, that is located in a southern neighborhood of, of Beirut, um, which is very tightly con like controlled by, by Hezbollah, um, which I think is part of the explanation of why people very much appreciate the use of uh, cryptocurrencies to make their transactions, because obviously they, it's an elegant way to avoid sanctions as well. Um, and so this little shop that you see here that is under that Lebanese flag um, is basically a place where 24 hours a day you can walk in with cash, buy crypto and have that crypto well, sent to you on your phone immediately and then sell it overseas if you want to. Um, because in that case, we, I made a transaction on chain, I afterwards looked up their chain address, their on chain address and, and just aggregated all the trades that happened um, in that shop between 2019 and 2021. So that's the first two years of the financial crisis in, in Lebanon. And that tiny little shop right there had a trade volume only on chain. So off chain, there might've been much more of more than 35 million US dollars, which is, um, well, maybe not quite what you, one would have in mind when you see this little hole in the wall. Um, interestingly, unlike any other shop in Lebanon where nobody gets any sort of receipt um, for any transactions these days because the exchange rate situation is so complicated, they were quite malicious in, in, in making sure that they would hand me a receipt and even had the, the serial numbers of the dollar bills that they handed to me, which I thought was somewhat interesting. And then um, at some point, I, I just, you know, to get another idea of where these people then actually find those shops, what you see here is two screenshots from um, chat rooms on Telegram chat rooms where people um, offer to buy or sell um, um, Bitcoin or at, at the time uh, Tether was, was very much on the rise. And what's interesting from this, especially on the right, for example, you see that the volumes are quite significant. What's in our, our sample, we see many, very many, very small transactions. Um, once you go to a shop like the one I just mentioned or um, met, met, meet up with a, a user like the one that's advertising in this chat on the right, um, the markets are quite deep. So these people are offering transactions of up to $1 million um, against cash, which is, I think, very particular to the Lebanese situation where the banking system is completely dysfunctional, but I think it's nonetheless interesting to kind of also take this into account when 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 um, remembering that yeah we looked at this tiny little window, um, there might be actually much more going on outside this this window of local becomes and, and Paxful that we looked at. So um, to conclude and then to be able to 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 discuss this a little more, I'm very much looking forward to any any questions and thoughts. Um, we basically. Um, show that cryptocurrencies can serve as a channel for transactions between fiat currencies, especially um, that this is especially um, attractive when capital controls aim at um, impeding such transfers. Um, we use also see channels being very attractive for the sending of remittances, which is kind of the counterparty to that. Um, we, well, this is basically, basically flies in the face of this idea that Bitcoin is a purely spe speculative bubble because when people actually use it, um, there's been a white literature that shows that the use case can actually underlie some sort of fundamental value for Bitcoin, which is um, how this is very closely linked to the literature. Um, then um, we, yeah, we do we do show that these sort of capital flows they've kind of are completely off the radar of any stock taking agency. Um, so similar to to cash, um, no one really knows how much these transactions actually sum up to, and that could potentially eventually be quite important um, for, um, for the policy discussions. 
Um, the possible policy implications is something that we've already seen quite a bit. We see countries that impose capital controls also being quite hawkish on cryptocurrency exchanges. So Nigeria has been trying to make them illegal. China is probably the most effective in actually doing so, but it's very hard also to do it, which I think is another interesting fact point to, to, um, to highlight. If China is not able to completely crack down on their crypto markets, then it's hard to imagine that um, countries with maybe less institutional strength can do the same. China has made it strictly illegal, and nonetheless, we do see Chinese trade appearing in our data and also elsewhere. And then um, an outlook, I think that's just an interesting question for future research. Of course, Bitcoin is somewhat like it's very good because it's in the sense that it's very global, but actually, well, if you have to choose between Bitcoin and the stable coin that was really on the rise since 2022 and have become very stable since 2022, then maybe you might be interested in rather using a stable coin where you don't have the same sort of um, price volatility risk. And I think so um, it would be interesting for future research to also consider um, how this could accelerate this sort of development and the use of cryptocurrencies as a vehicle to move capital um, even more. Thank you very much for, yeah. For, for your attention. I'm really looking forward to any questions or comments. Great. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Great uh, uh, anecdotes too. Uh, really fascinating um, agenda. You should raise your hand and then you can you will be demuted by Elise um, and ask your question. So go ahead, please. Hey, Clemens and Ken, great presentation. Thank you very much. I uh, particularly like the, the case study you showed in Venezuela, but I got a bit confused with the orders of magnitude there. Um, doesn't this case study suggest that the share of cross-border trading is much higher than the 11% that you showed? Let, let me say something and Clemens can add. The 11% on uh, the transactions confirming the transactions trade. And yes, the Venezuela case gives much larger numbers. We picked, we wanted to dem, we wanted to get proof of concept and to show that absolutely it's being used for transactions. But we're we give a note, we the way we developed our algorithm, it's a very much a lower bound on it. And the Venezuela case shows that A, the number of transactions is much higher. We do find, because for Paxville, we have the geolocation, we kind of know most of it is international, even if it's going from dollars to dollars, that it seems to be international. I'll let Clemens expand. Yeah, I think the, the most important point you, you've already mentioned, um, as we said, this is like this is evidence that, or just supporting the point that we made before, that this is really a, a lower bound and a proof of concept the real share of, of trades, at least on these two exchanges, is likely to be much higher. Um, as you as you pointed out correctly, for example, Colombia here um, has an, a total identified trade share of six point five percent. Forty two percent of that um, goes to to Venezuela, so that would make it be that would basically indicate that well, if there is a power cut in Venezuela, then it maybe should drop to by ten percent at most. But that would already be quite crazy. Um, instead, we see this huge drop by over 50%. So that really suggests that um, the, the the real share might be might be quite a bit quite a bit higher. Christoph, could I just take one or two of the online questions, uh, or how did you want to do that? Yeah, that's great too. I see uh, Philip Philip next in line, but maybe after Philip, we can we can do the online okay. questions. Yes, hi, thanks. Very, very interesting. I, I have a question on uh, the. Um, the use of uh, crypto to, to evade capital uh, controls. Um, would there be a way to look at um, whether uh, this has substituted to other manners to evade capital controls, such as uh, you know, manipulating prices of uh, exports and imports, and to see to what extent, uh, for example, during this uh, event study, something's happening on export prices and import prices. So I don't know whether uh, this capital controls evasion is mostly from households or from firms, but maybe be interesting to see if you know other ways through which you can evade capital controls are less used when you use more crypto. Let me do a first pass at that. I mean, of course, 
the classic way of evading capital controls is under and over invoicing, but it requires quite a bit of scale to make that work. Uh, you have to you know, have a business and be doing trade. Whereas, uh, for example, remittances, a lot of people uh, trying to avoid the costs and capital, a lot of the costs are capital controls and remittances. And the World Bank you know, has global remittances at over $600 billion a year. It's a big number. And it appears, and I, I would quote a word bank, World Bank official, except that official happened to be Carmen Reinhardt when she was making this statement. But I presume it's based on uh, uh, other, other things, that it's a huge percentage seems to have gone into uh, crypto. I think she was quoting for even 30 and 40% in many countries. Uh, so it's, it's uh, I mean, it's, it's not the only way you're avoiding capital controls, but it's sort of a new way, as we say in the title, a new age way. And, and I, I would actually, so it's something that I'm, I'm, I would be interested in looking into as well, because I've thought about this quite a bit. My prior is that actually you would see more trade misinvoicing as this increases, because because essentially what this allows people to do is kind of democratize um, the, the, the capital, eva uh, capital control evasion. Um, eventually, eventually there needs to be a buyer for a seller. And so I think there needs to be a concentration of the, of the, of the concrete outflow that then would likely happen through, to, to, through more traditional channels, if that makes sense. But it's definitely a question that was very interesting to, to look into. Why don't I just pick up one of the questions while people are thinking and we'll try to get to all of them. But there's a question about uh, all of the crypto currencies, whether they're proof of stake. I'm answering the uh, question of there have been news reports about the high degree of concentration in Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin markets if a small number of players uh, control uh, a lot of the mining power. Uh, or if a country controls a lot of mine power. And this is a problem with both proof of work and with proof of stake ultimately, but it's not really relevant to what we're doing because exactly we're looking at people who are not speculating. They don't care if the price of Bitcoin 60,000, 30,000, they actually just care about the dollar amount and they're doing a trade using it as a vehicle. Uh, trans uh, uh, transaction vehicles, we call it, and they're getting in and out really fast. So it's a it's a very interesting question about the future of cryptocurrencies, but I don't think uh, relevant to uh, what we're doing. Uh, maybe I, I could I could chip in a question uh, uh, taking the priority of, of, of being the moderator. So um, I was wondering whether you've looked at kind of emergency situations, like you, you mentioned the case of uh, Argentina, um, but uh, what about uh, the Corona crisis? Uh, is that, or other kind of uh, maybe natural disasters occurring? Um, do you see an uptick, like thinking of it as kind of a remittance vehicle, um, do you see an uptick in, in especially countries where um, you know either have that either have tight capital controls or that have a dysfunctional um, dysfunctional financial systems? Uh, can you see kind of a, ha have you looked at those kind of um, episodes? Uh, I would be curious whether uh, you know or in March 2020 you've seen kind of a, uh, a start increase of, of of this kind of vehicle. So maybe I, I um, can can respond to that. Um, the the whole time series dimension is, I think, a really really interesting one that we at this point leave um, like we we don't give a lot of attention to simply because we kind of focus on this this core um, question. But I think it's a very very interesting one, and I think the the Corona example, the, like March twenty twenty, I think would be the the go to 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 have a look at. Um, we have a look at the time series dimension only around the capital controls because that's something we looked at in, in particular. Um, but it is it is true that it would make a lot of sense to do the same thing around um, the the onset of the COVID pandemic um, for the sort of kind of the flip side, right? The remittance flows. 
And so um, that's definitely a great suggestion we'll, we'll take into account. Thank you. Will you make this data available? I mean, it looks like uh, it's something one can use for a variety of, re of, of, of applications. Do you want to take, I mean, the data is available. It's just yeah, a question of pulling it. With like the two years uh, of cleaning. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess uh, uh, certainly on publication, which we hope soon will, you know, give everything uh, of how we do it, although you could do it for yourself, but there's no, there's no proprietary data here. In fact, that's what's so unique about it. What's an interesting question, what we're, we'd like to provoke is uh, authorities can request such data, the governing authority. Now, there are reasons they don't because that, that it might scare the business, uh, but we're, you, know, you could potentially use our algorithm on many other examples, but these two happen to publish you know, this in, incredibly comprehensive data. That's great. I, I'd be curious to learn also on the uh, on Russia and sanction uh, evasion, right? Uh, to track where did the money go exactly? So uh, you know the the there've been Clemens has looked at this deeply, but uh, I mean obviously Bitcoin got used in Ukraine and Russia. And probably if we have World War III at the end of this, you know, you'll wish you had invested in Bitcoin uh, as being something uh, useful. Uh, but it's uh, it's not as, I, and you hear lots of stories about Ukrainians, especially they end up uh, in Poland and they're so glad they had Bitcoin uh, because they were able to use that because they couldn't um, move money out. But it, it's it's not as striking in the in the data we have as you might have expected, particularly on the Russian side. Do, do you want to expand on that, Clemens? At all? No, I think you made it really important. Like that's, I think you, you summarized it very well. I just laughed because I thought like tomorrow there's going to be a headline in some obscure news that says Kenneth Rogers said you should have invested in Bitcoin. <laughs> um, I think an in, in interesting like an interesting point about this just maybe the last like the russian we we see the the use of russian ruble is a very um popular one even before the crisis because of um sanctions i think being a, a, an interesting topic even since 2015 so the russian ruble is quite prominent um even before the ukraine the invasion of ukraine but again another event study that i think would be interesting to look at so i think there's a few that would be yeah, that would be an interesting sort of um, next step from from this analysis. Um, I'm uh, I'm uh, seeing that more questions came in. Um, Willem Boyder asks, "Do you have any sense of the relative size of on-chain and off-chain transactions?" We address that in the paper, uh, and uh, we we give their their estimates of this, but precisely because a lot of the uh, off-chain don't provide their data, you're making uh, estimates of it. I mean, the estimates are in the range of 20 to one off-chain versus on-chain, but that one of the reasons that could be too high is some of the uh, exchanges have an incentive to pretend there's a lot going on on their exchange and give some number that's inflated so that everybody flocks to their exchange and thinks that it's you know really useful. So we we don't we don't have anything definitive. We know that our exchanges are not big ones, and we know the number of transactions, as I mentioned, is the same order of magnitude as all of the on-chain transactions over the same period, although the, the sums are much smaller. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, does the increase in the use of crypto also mean a decline in other forms of traditional money transfer? Uh, so I guess, you know, do you have access to kind of uh, Western Union data or comparing those? I don't know. 
or traditional bank? That's that's not something we have uh, we've looked at at, at uh, this point in time. It's also yeah, it's a bit difficult because over this period, as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of like drivers, and it's not very clear how you know remittances we know that developed very significantly also around the COVID pandemic, and so it's kind of hard to 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 arrive at a at a counterfactual there, but it, there might be something to do there. I. Um, I mean, I think the IMF and the World Bank are all over this, uh, trying to figure this out, but I, I haven't seen anything that they published yet. Okay, um, then Rui tried to ask a question. Just a small question about El Salvador, right? So we know that the press probably unwisely decided to uh, declare Bitcoin uh, legal tender. Did you observe a reduction in uh, the frequency of these vehicle trades with Bitcoin after that? Uh, we did not just partly due to the fact that um, those transactions are happening in, in, in US dollar, right? So on both mm -hmm. sides of the on both sides of the, the both like destination at the origin will typically then be US dollars. I suspect when people want to send money to the US or receive remittances from the US. Um, and so in the yeah, in the standard approach, we would those would fall into crypto vehicle trades that we see um, that go US dollar to US dollar. And because there's so many other countries that are dollarized or using dollars when trading with um, Bitcoin, I don't like El Salvador. I would suspect wouldn't be big enough to make um, a, a big impact there, especially because also the imp like the 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 rate of of people actually switching to using this uh, I think it's called Chivo wallet that they introduced wasn't yeah. very wasn't very high, and so. I suspect we wouldn't see much, especially given that it's so noisy because you have the aggregate of US dollar to US dollar trades, which includes, for example, a lot of trades to Argentina, Lebanon, but also um, to to Ecuador and, and so on. And so, yeah, that's my, my prior would be that they, we probably wouldn't see much there. I, I mean, but just to, to say for the, pa the Paxful data set, we can identify where the people are. So even when it's US dollar to dollar, it appears we, we actually discovered that when we got that data set where a lot of that is moving the dollars just used to move from one country to another. I think, uh, again, Clemens can speak to this better, but I mean, El Salvador is not necessarily a huge player in the market. So there's a question of you could, there, there are lots of different exchanges. Some are deeper in some countries than other countries. And I'm, I'm not sure if uh, ours were that deep in El Salvador. Thank you. Great. Thank you so we have, um, we have a couple more here. Um, I guess, Ken, you'll have to leave because you have another talk. I, that I, 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 so, I so apologize, but as Christoph knows, I had a pre-existing uh, commitment to be on another webinar. And so uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, allowing us to present this and we'll happy to take uh, further questions uh, by, e by email. And uh, the paper, the latest version of the paper is posted on my website and I think you sent a link. Uh, I, th I think Elise sent a link with the uh, email for the seminar. So th thank you very much. And uh, uh, hope the re uh, uh, I'm sure Clemens will more than ably uh, answer all the other questions. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Ken. Uh, so let me maybe uh, uh, point to two or three more. Um, there is one technical one by Paula Di Casola. I have a question. Do you identify cross-border, i.e. cross-country flows or cross-currency flows? So can cross-currency flows actually happen within the same country? So they be asking for uh, the, the actual geographic direction versus currency direction. Yeah, so this is something that until we um, downloaded and added the Paxful data was an uh, issue that was really puzzling to us. Because we saw a lot of trades from US dollar to US dollar, and we thought, okay, what are people doing? Sending money to LA from New York, or but why are they not using Venmo? What's what's happening here? Um, and so we do in the data only actually look at cross currency flows. That's a very important comment. Um, but then we get for the larger part of our data set, we actually have these geo tags. Now it's a bit tricky because officially the website doesn't share those, so there's no 
it's it's it, the, the the website isn't supposed to have those in the API, but they were there once we downloaded them. And so um, um, we're thankful for the for the for that mistake, I suppose. Um, but essentially, we, that allowed us to then see, okay, actually, when when there's a US dollar to US dollar trade. 95% of the time, those were actually involving, you know, Argentina, El Salvador, Lebanon, um, countries where um, the dollar is used quite widely. And we saw that even in countries where that are not dollarized, um, people seem to be using um, dollars to make transactions um, against um, Bitcoin. So, so that, that there always seems to be in many countries a sort of local currency versus Bitcoin, as well as dollar versus Bitcoin market that and people are trading in and so yeah in short it's a, actually a, to be it would be more accurate to speak about cross currency of course thanks for that comment great i, I suppose we take two more by charles Wiplosh and richard portes and then we call it a day because it, we should end at um 1815 or oh, charles great that you you raised your hand so go ahead uh thank you very much a uh, fascinating study uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask whether you can comment a little bit on the map you showed. Uh, the, you had the world map, and I seem to remember there is money going from Russia and China to some African countries. Uh, yeah. Um, what's going on in these African countries? Australia as well. Um, very good question. I, we don't really have a, a very good answer at this point. Um, some of the some of the suspicion is is it being um, remittances at least for Australia, um, but then that's I mean we know as much as you on on that. We really just we look at this map and we say okay, this uh, mirrors a lot of like remittances flows that we know about. But then there's some things in there that are um, less less obvious. For example, um, China to um, China to Nigeria. That's not something that we would have expected um, to see in the top twenty five. Um, flows um maybe russia to venezuela a bit more makes it a little bit more sense from a geopolitical re point of view but then there's also the question who's making those transactions um i i don't know it, my guess is as good as yours um <laughs> that really requires some future research and i think um yeah that would actually be possible if someone managed to get equally international um, exchanges to share the user data, right? Because then we could get a better idea of who these people actually are or entities. But that would require like regulatory effort. Cool. Uh, let's go the last one by Richard Portes. Um, a recent paper estimates that 75% of exchange trades are wash trading intended to inflate the importance of the exchange. If you accept that, how does it affect your interpretation of the recorded trade data? So how, how inflated is this? Um, so like wash trading is is definitely an issue, especially when looking and using our algorithm with um, centralized exchanges. So not peer to peer exchanges, because these centralized exchanges have a, an incentive to, to show significant trade volumes, as Ken mentioned, to look more attractive to traders, because that flags sort of deeper markets and and, and and so more liquidity for the peer-to-peer -peer exchanges they're not very deep and i don't think any of these peer-to-peer -peer exchanges claim to be deep there's price premium that are pretty significant at a given point in time and um, simply because the prices aren't very like the markets aren't deep enough and li not liquid enough in a given country in a given country at a given point in time and so um i don't think there's any incentive for these um for these companies to kind of um you know misreports so that's the one part and then on the wash trading side um it's unlikely to be happening unless it's the exchanges themselves where then it just equates misreporting because there's a, a fee that um is issued on every exchange that is quite significant it's one percent um and so um with the, those fees wash trading to like on trades that are actually being executed wouldn't be very attractive so we we address this in the paper and discuss it and we don't think it's the case also because if these exchanges were um you know misreporting or or themselves wash trading in the on the exchange then we would expect their their volume trade volumes to be much higher they're not actually falling within the biggest exchanges at all they're not trying to compete with the F, uh, with the the bid binances and the the ftx's out there and so we don't 
see a lot like we don't find we do, we don't take this as a as a huge threat to our our validity but we can't rule it out neither we have to kind of trust the data provider essentially to some extent great so thanks so much uh great discussion too uh wonderful uh, paper and uh, with the data uh, on that that map alone uh, looks like a lot of as you said uh, future work uh, being needed here uh, wonderful so um, thanks to everybody uh, for joining uh, thanks especially to uh, Clemens and Ken and uh, we'll meet Thank again so for having us on the first Thursday of June um, and uh, until then enjoy uh, the Easter break and, and the coming weeks. All right.